Good morning. Welcome to the table. We are so glad you're here. Would you stand with us as we sing to our God? This is the day the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. His love endures forever, so we're going to give him all of our thanks, all of our praise. Sing this together. Give thanks to the Lord. His love endures forever. Give praise to the Lord. Beside him there's no other. Sing that again. Give thanks. Give thanks to the Lord. His love endures forever. Give praise to the Lord. Beside him there's no other. This is the day. Yeah, this is the day the Lord has made And I will rejoice and be glad in it Yeah, this is the day the Lord has made I will rejoice and be glad in it He brought us from morning to dancing From glory to glory Yeah, this is the day the Lord has made So what are we waiting for? rejoice together this morning his mighty wonders are too many to name he 
is the same God that created the world, the same God that saved the world. So we're going to humbly come before him and say, God, you are my God and I need you. Even when I don't understand your ways, I can trust you and not be afraid. Let's sing this together. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who to do the same thing for me. Would you just come before him and tell him that you need him? Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing trust him.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, I want to welcome you all and thank you so much for your presence today, worshiping at the table here at Church of St. John the Divine. I know I speak for Bishop Josiah, Father Charlie, Sarah, and our wonderful musicians here today, and just saying how privileged we all are to gather together in worship of the Lord. In our tradition, as you probably know, uh, we begin worship with a prayer that is meant to put us in a right disposition uh, in the presence of the Lord. So would you pray with me? Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that your grace may always precede and follow us, that we may continually be given to good works through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to be seated for the readings of Scripture. A reading from the book of Exodus. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, in order that I may make a great nation out of you. But Moses implored the Lord of his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them out, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self, 
and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised, I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. And again Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son, and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner and my oxen, my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry and sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guest, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, our desire is to please you in all things at all time. Speak to us now from this passage and grant us the gift of obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? The question I would love for us to consider together this morning is this. Are you properly dressed? The challenge for all who follow Jesus Christ is how to please him all the time and in every place. So the second part of this parable read to us is the section we will be focusing on. But I want to say a few things from the first seven verses. But the message is simple in verses 8 to 14. While God is perfectly willing to clothe us in the garments of Jesus Christ, it is up to us to put them on and wear them faithfully 
to the glory of the Lord. To me, that is the main message from the second part of this parable. Now, in the first part, we have a reason for salvation being taken from the Jews, the people of the promise, and given to the non-Jews, we call Gentiles. And the reason is this, the Gentiles accepted Jesus as the promised Messiah. The Jews refused. Now the early church got this message. Friends, the same can happen to any individual. You have an opportunity and you, you, you flaunt it. You don't seize on that opportunity. You lose it. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is with us. The table is spread. The banquet hall must be filled. And if you and I are not willing to put God first, our seat will be given to somebody else, he or she who is ready. So the truth is, whatever excuse you or I may give, the kingdom must go on. I remember as a young priest, after every Sunday service, a group of young people will come to the vicarage and we will share a meal together and share fellowship. There was this young doctor and I took interest in him. I kept saying to him, friend, when will you come to Christ? And all the time he would say to me, when I've made enough money. I'm sure that resonates with some people. When I've made enough money, I will come to Christ. I felt sorry for him because not long after that, he had his own hospital. Not long after that, on a Sunday afternoon, we were having this fellowship, and he started coughing in a very strange way. Very unusual. So he was rushed to his own hospital. He never made it. Very tragic. He was a young, promising young man. And I said to him, when will you come to Christ? When will you take your seat at the banquet hall when I've made enough money? Friends, the truth is, whatever excuse you or I may give, the kingdom must go on. People will respond. God is at work reconciling the world to himself and if we are too busy, like this medical doctor, or for whatever reason, unwilling to be part of the ministry of reconciliation, God will choose others to do his bidding. He is God. So this parable throws some light on what it means to be a disciple. We've had six Lessons now from the rector on being in his likeness, all focusing on what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. This parable throws some more light on what we've been sharing together. I believe from this parable we learn that to be a disciple of Jesus is to make Jesus your first priority to offer the first fruits of our time, our talent, 
gifts and service, not whatever is left over after everything else is done and all the bills paid. That's what this parable is teaching us. And as we think of pledging, I want us to take this very seriously from this parable. I want to repeat myself, which I don't usually do. What does this parable tell us about being a disciple? To be a disciple of Jesus Christ is to make him your first priority. To offer the first fruits of our time, talent, gifts, and service. Not whatever is left over after everything else is done and all the bills paid. Now the good news is the kingdom of God is at hand and we are the honored guests. However, we must dress accordingly. And this now brings us to the second part of the parable. The king, we are told, mixed and mingled with his guests and noticed one guest that was not wearing a proper wedding garment. This guest was, to say the least, disrespectful. Now, we learn that in the days of Jesus, guests coming to a royal banquet were expected to wear festal garments. And Richard Bokman throws some light on what is going on here. He says in his article, wearing festal garments indicated one's full participation in the joy of the feast. So this guest was not actually involved. He wasn't engaged. He came there for his own sake. He was not there to honor the king and celebrate the marriage of the prince. He was there to enjoy the food and the drinks. Now, in the Bible, clothes have a symbolic meaning. They are a sign of being dressed in the righteousness of God. And this is what Paul tells us in his epistle to the Ephesians in chapter 4. Let me summarize what he says in verses 22 to 24. Paul says, put off your old self and put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Put off your old self and put on your new self, your new being, as a result of the death and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the cross for your sake and for my sake. So here, God is calling us now more than ever to put on Christ and bear witness to his grace and love in the world around us. And the world around us today is unpredictable. It's a world that keeps changing. It's a world that does not believe in anything fixed. It's a world that is evolving. A world that is almost antichrist. And it is in this world that Christ is calling us to put on Christ. So to be clothed in the righteousness of God is to be immersed, to be soaked in the teachings of Jesus, the Christ, and filled 
with the Holy Spirit, as Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6. Now, the good news is God supplies all the clothes, all the garments we need to fight the sinfulness of injustice and oppression in this world, the self-centeredness and greed that are all around us all the time as followers of Jesus Christ. God in Christ gives us the clothes, the garments, as a free gift through the death and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But there is a catch here. What is the catch? We have to be willing to wear them. Not only in church on Sunday morning, but throughout the week. In our homes, in our place of work, and in our neighborhood. I'm aware that this is a tough call. In a world of relativism, in a world that to stand out and to be different is becoming more and more difficult. Friends, God wants to clothe us in garments of Christ. However, he leaves it up to us to put them on. Are you properly dressed? At my ordination in 1971, I chose to wear a clerical collar. And I've worn a clerical collar since then. It's now over 50 years. My reason for doing this is simple. I see it as a sign of my calling to be a minister of word and sacrament and be available to everyone that needs my services. So I wear a clerical collar because it makes me think twice in every situation. I confess I don't always do it correctly, but it makes me think twice. People watch to see how you handle various situations. And number two, you are expected to set a good example in every situation. I believe this holds true for every one of us who walks in the footsteps of Jesus. Being in his likeness. This, to me, holds for all of us. We are called to live by a higher standard of righteousness than the world around us. When we fail to do that, we forfeit our witness. When we do, others see the Spirit of God at work in us and are encouraged to follow our example. Today we are told the number of nouns is on the rise. Why? It is because, one of the reasons, is because those of us who are followers of Jesus, the Christ, are not always properly dressed. And that is what I believe this parable is reminding us of. Jesus told his disciples, by their fruits, you will know them. Paul's exhortation is, put on Christ. Well, I'm not suggesting that you all go about wearing a clerical collar. But I would like for you to think of some tangible way you can, in Paul's words, put on Christ. Think of doing something creative 
to distinguish yourself as a disciple of Jesus the Christ. Not to call attention to yourself, but to let others know and to remind yourself that you belong to Christ. Are you properly dressed? May God help us in a changing and unpredictable world we find ourselves. May God help us to be properly dressed and to do what Christ will do, no matter what the circumstances are. Amen. Thank you, Bishop Josiah. What a strong word for all of us and so needful. Um, you don't realize how blessed we are to have this man here in our midst. Um, really grateful. So, <laughs> I would uh, love to take about four or five minutes in prayer with you. So if you just stand with me. And I invite your prayers of intercession or thanksgiving at any point in these minutes, silently or aloud. But let us pray for the church and for the world. Lord, we thank you for um, the word that you have delivered to us this morning through your servant, Bishop Josiah. Yeah, that's a... It's a tough parable that you taught your followers that we hear afresh today, but at the heart of it, Lord, is that the king wants anybody and everybody, good and bad, all of us are invited to the banquet, Lord. We thank you. Through no merit of our own have we been given this invitation and this pure grace. But, Lord, as we've heard, we are called to respond and to respond by putting on the new self, the garments of salvation, Lord, not only for our sake and to honor you, but for the sake of others who will look at our lives to see a manifestation of your glory, your kingdom. So help us, God, to be the church that you've called us to be, to be the, the believers, the brothers and sisters together that you want us to be here at Church of St. John the Divine, and we pray the same for the church all over the world. We pray for the mission of the body of Christ. And where there are Christians and especially other parts of the world who are endangered for their faith, we ask, Lord, that you would protect them and strengthen them. God, we pray for our very broken, violent world I know all of us come into this room today um, with such anxiety and heavy hearts over what's going on in the Middle East, in Israel. It's difficult to see a way forward. It's difficult for us even to talk with one another about it. Passions run so high. But Lord, we just pray that your Holy Spirit alone um, has power to bring peace and justice, that peoples who are different would live together in harmony, and that all people would come to know you as you are, Jesus Christ. We lean into that. We pray for our own nation. We pray for wisdom, strength, maturity in our national leaders. We pray for the concerns of our city here in Houston. On this particular weekend, when we are mindful to be more attentive and responsive to the homeless, Lord, we hope that you would uh, help us to see the face of Jesus in their eyes. Help us to provide them with shelter, sustenance, and hope in their darkest hours. I invite you to join me in praying for those who suffer or in any kind of trouble for those who are sick, lonely, for the dying. We lift up especially Shelley and Meredith, John, Sally, Kathy, Carolyn, and Lisa, Susan, Sarah, 
Bill and Bruce, Christy, Milton, Bob, Josie, Craig, Gary, Jenny, Maggie, Don, others you may wish to name. We give you thanks for those who have been recently born. We give you thanks for the lives of those who are recently departed. O oh Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people and the multitude of your mercies look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. And as we make our preparations to come to the king's table, his banquet, let us cleanse ourselves of anything that might separate us from the love of God. So let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Alrighty. Well, again, I want to say how pleased I am um, to share and worship with you all in this, this space this morning. Thank you all for coming today. Um, if you're here as a visitor, just know how grateful we are for your presence. I would love uh, to have a chance to shake your hand. I know I speak for uh, Josiah um, as well as Charlie in, in sharing that. Um, but thank you. This is a very, very special community of faith here. It really is. I want to just, this is, I'm going off script here a little bit. Don't worry. I won't, I won't take too much time. But um, just because of the fact that we have multiple services at the same time here on Sunday mornings, I'm, I'm more often over in the church at this hour, I'm trying to schedule myself looking forward uh, more often in this space. And um, this is a great, great service. I mean, we have incredible Christian music here, um, solid. Uh, I say this because I'm not in here all that often, but I mean, we have solid preaching. Uh, it's a good liturgy. And, you know, we've got empty chairs in here. And, I mean, it's a big room, and people have options. If they come to church, if they want modern worship, there are other options out here in the city of Houston. We know that. Um, and we, we have even architectural challenges, you know, just by virtue of the doors and the entrances are not as public as we would like them to be, and hopefully in the future they will be. What I'm getting at is I would just love it if you would encourage your friends and neighbors to come and join us for this service. I think the way this service will begin to grow um, is not simply liturgical tweaks and adjustments, um, but because people who come and find Christ here will want to share that with people that you know or meet. So please, help us out. I think there's tremendous potential um, for this service uh, to, to, to touch more and more lives. 
Well, I always encourage you to just be attentive to the featured five card that we pass out around here on Sundays. I mentioned in the prayers, this is a World Homeless Weekend. There's a photographic exhibit uh, display, I should say, in Sumner's Hall. Please take a look at that after the service. Uh, look at the featured five card as we seek as a church to be more responsive to the needs of the homeless. Next weekend, we have um, a new but very important tradition of this church already, October on the Boulevard, the third annual. Three things. One, y'all come from 4 to 7, October 22nd. Number two, again, invite a friend or a neighbor. You know, we, it's a part of our strategic aim here to be a more and more invitational culture. This is a great opportunity for you to step into that and practice it. Um, invite people that you know on your streets, anywhere you're rubbing shoulders with others to come. It's a fun afternoon. And number three, if you have time and are willing, we'd love to have a little more volunteer support uh, so you can help us with that. Thank you. Lastly, um, as you should know by now, we are in the midst of our annual stewardship campaign, looking ahead to 2024 and wanting to make appropriate preparations for that in every way, including uh, for the financial provision of our parish life. Um, you can listen to me or other people who dress like this anytime to talk about stewardship, generosity. I'd love to do that. It's, I think, more powerful when we have testimony from some of our own lay leaders. So I'd like to invite up here Beth Bunk, who's not just simply uh, a leader today to talk a little bit about this, but is actually the chair of our generosity committee, uh, chairing this effort for next year right now. And I couldn't be more grateful for your leadership. So, yes, take the microphone, um, and we're asking um, lay leaders today a very, very simple question. How has being a disciple and growing in Christ-likeness helped you to become more generous? Thank you for having me um, today. Um, Lee has heard me answer this question before, so I approach this a little bit differently. Um, I'm a practical giver. Um, being an accountant and CPA, I approach it from the fact that I want the money that I give to the church to, I want to see where it's going and what it's being used for. And that includes keeping the lights on, that includes priest salaries, but it also includes this amazing approach that we're taking to moving out into the kingdom and being present in the city. And so I feel like that is my call to donate to that and to give generously because of all the exciting things that are going on. And we feel very blessed that um, this, the Generosity Committee has kicked off this um, campaign right at the end of our discipleship, six weeks discipleship series. It couldn't have been a better um, team approach, right? <laughs> but um, I encourage all of you to, to give what is in your hearts and also the amount doesn't necessarily matter. We are looking for new pleasures. We're looking for new people who want to commit something, a small amount even, to the church. We're expanding our um, membership and we want to expand the number of pledgers that we have. So thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Such a great job leading our generosity. Appreciate your good word there. Well, brothers and sisters, you, you've already heard Jesus' parable. Um, the king has gone into the highways and byways to send out uh, invitations to the likes of us, and we've accepted. We're here. Uh, so my prayer is that as you come forward, you will be grateful again to put on the, the garments worthy of a life in Christ and that we would go forth here as changed people today because no one who receives the power and the presence of Jesus can ever remain the same. Thank you.
Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and dark angels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, and this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And may the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. This is the